Hi everyone, this is uh, Zubair Bhatti, Senior Public Sector Specialist uh, based in Islamabad uh, and I'm happy to introduce number four of the series of webinars based on the book Lockdown Smart Government Solution from South Asia which has been co-authored by uh, Tony Verheyen, Jody Cusack and myself. It came out last year. Our speaker for today is Professor Michael Kellen. He is at Harvard University and got his PhD from University of California, San Diego. I've had the pleasure of working with Michael over the last four or five years. And, and I can say with confidence that Michael is, is a leading researcher of the intersection of ICT and governance in day-to-day -day service delivery uh, and he has done exciting experiments both in Afghanistan, Pakistan and elsewhere. Uh, we are very pleased to have Michael who is these days based in uh, Kennedy School of Government and uh, we'll have about 30-40 minutes of Michael's presentation and then we'll see questions uh, and uh, I look forward uh, uh, to an exciting uh, session. Over to you Michael uh, uh, for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Zubair, for the kind introduction. Uh, and thanks to the World Bank for inviting me uh, to, give this, to give this webinar. Very strong consensus that having an effective state is absolutely essential uh, to facilitating broader economic development and to making sure that that essential essential services are delivered. Uh, and so, you know, we've gotten to a stage now, I think, with research and with thinking about how to how to strengthen policy, where it comes down to very sort of nuts and bolts issues about how to make governments deliver for their citizens. Um, at the same time, and in parallel. Uh, we're living in a world where kind of access to information communication technology is, you know, vastly expanded and is proliferating very, very rapidly. Uh, and this opens a pretty broad scope of new things that we'd like to do. Uh, and I, I'll speak about some of those today. Uh, but just quickly as an example of the, the, the degree of the spread of technology uh, in poor countries, uh, three-fourths of the world's inhabitants today have access to a mobile phone and, and many of those people indeed live in developing countries. And so, you know, I see this as creating sort of two broad spaces uh, for new opportunity. And the first is really opportunity for new types of policy action. And, and these are really, you know, governance innovations of the sort that Zubair discusses in his book and that are really kind of the focus of this webinar series. Uh, it opens, you know, the opportunity to do things like what I'll describe today, a smart smartphone-based service initiative. Uh, We've done a project where we can, because we have lots of information on where people are and what they're doing in the government, we can customize incentives based on individual differences that we observe in their behavior. Uh, and the final, which I'll discuss if, if time allows today, uh, is a project you know, using mobile, mobile money-based salaries, which is actually becoming a very broad initiative and hopefully provides a means of, of reducing leakage in, in salary disbursements. Uh, the other kind of broad class of opportunities that this opens are opportunities for research. Um, once we start to introduce new sets of incentives, we can also look into these organizations and ask kind of very basic questions related to the personnel of the state. Uh, how do they react to changes in incentives? Who reacts to changes in incentives? Uh, and, you know, it allows, I guess, researchers to begin to have a much more fundamental understanding of sort of basic issues uh, around 
you know, organizational economics and, and, you know, how we can bring those ideas and insights to bear uh, to make the state more effective. And so today I'm going to try to talk again about the smartphone-based service initiative uh, and talk a little bit about kind of differences in terms of the personality of people who are affected by this new program uh, and to, to learn more about kind of basic personnel issues. Uh, so the first project uh, we've titled Personalities in Public Sector Performance, this is based on an academic paper currently off with four Pakistan authors uh, uh, and is based on an experiment that we ran in collaboration uh, with, with Zubair. And the motivation for the project uh, is similar to the motivation for this webinar series. Governance, which we know play, play a key role in facilitating economic development and, those, of course, in delivering services, are fundamentally com composed of people. Uh, and so if we want to ask nuts and bolts questions about how to make governments more effective, it becomes very important to understand kind of who these people are and how they react to changes in incentives, uh, what are the nature of the relationships between people and the state, and so on. Uh, and we know kind of from other domains that sort of stable measures of personality and these are measures used by personality psychologists uh, as a means of kind of trying to understand differences between between people people. Highly predictive of things. Things that we can. care about the predictive of wages, they're predictive of advancement, and, and indeed often more predictive Than 
been caught. Um, and so you know we we hope kind of broadly that, that starting to dig in, into the heterogeneity in personnel uh, may provide you know new avenues for for thinking about ways of of improving state effectiveness. I guess there there are some signal issues. Uh, Uh, with with some some of our participants, uh, but I'll I'll continue on. Uh, so we're going to ask this question in the context of a service delivery failure that's very, very common in developing countries. So if you look across Latin America, East Asia, uh, South, you know, East Africa, and and certainly in South Asia. Uh, kind of everywhere that we have systematic data, we often find that both in health and in education, frontline service delivery providers are not available. Uh, so, you know, the average rate across other countries tends to be in the, in the neighborhood of 25 to 40 percent. Uh, if we look specifically, uh, if we look specifically uh, it, it, in, in our context, so we're, these are going to be data based on our own independent assessment. We have a doctor absence rate of 68.5%. Uh, now, if we try to condition on figuring out where doctors are officially posted, that looks more like 50%, but kind of any way that you measure this, uh, it's definitely kind of an extreme outlier in the sense of the degree of, of, of absence. And so the, the essential question we want to ask is kind of what is explaining this uh, and what can we use technology, how can we use technology uh, to try to address this problem? Uh, and so, okay. Uh, I'll. I, I ask that you know the questions will be moderated. So I suppose I, I'll just collect them and 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 answer them at the end. Okay. And so, in this study, we're going to ask three broad research questions, three essential questions. Uh, <clears throat> the first we're going to ask is: Are differences in measurable personality traits? associated with differences in worker performance. And so this is kind of under status quo incentive before we do anything uh, to change the system. 
And now the second and kind of much more fundamentally related to, to, the, to the webinar series is we want to introduce a new smartphone monitoring program. Uh, this is going to be a program where inspectors are going to carry smartphones on their inspections. Uh, their inspections will then subsequently be geostamped and timestamped, creating a very strong incentive for them uh, to, make, to visit the facilities that they are supposed to, uh, <coughs> that they are supposed to visit. And, and so we want to ask first, does this system work? Uh, can this represent a means of improving service delivery? Uh, and second, do these personality measures predict who's going to respond to this change in incentives? Can we kind of get a sense of who this is going to affect and who this isn't going to affect? Uh, now, the final and core question in this study uh, is do these measures predict who's going to act on information? So the smartphone system is going to be centralizing a bunch of information on where doctors are going to work. Uh, this is kind of very geographically dispersed information that otherwise would be very, very difficult to collect if not for the availability of technology. But technology sort of eliminates the, the information bottleneck and brings all of the information together. Uh, and so once we've done that, we can start to ask, now if I give a senior health administrator information on where doctors are working and where they aren't working, uh, do differences in their personality predict how they, who acts on this information, who takes this information on doctor absence, and actually puts it into action uh, by going out and, and trying to address the problem. Okay, uh, there are going to be four essential ingredients uh, in this project. Uh, the first is we're going to need to take these measures, so in surveys with a number of officials at different layers of the health administration in Punjab, Pakistan, uh, we're going to actually collect measures of, of, of kind of stable personality differences, and I'll describe precisely what those are shortly. Um, but, you, you know, so that's one, I think, one advantage of the study is we actually have these things and, and, and that empowers us to, to answer these questions. And now, the second essential ingredient is we're going to want to link these to performance data, whether doctors are present, whether inspections are taking place, uh, and whether or not there's some evidence that doctors and inspectors are working together to falsify reports, and, and I'll describe precisely how we measure that on a subsequent slide. Uh, and then we're going to combine this with two experiments, which I think really in, embody the spirit, the, the spirit of the smart government approach. Uh, we're going to implement a system, but we're going to implement it in such a way that it makes it possible for us to iteratively and, and through a collaboration with the Department of Health to assess its impact and to, to make recommendations about how and where it can be made more effective. Uh, and the second experiment embedded in this is we're going to actually introduce a manipulation into the data uh, available to senior health officials on doctor attendance, and that's going to be the basis for us to start to ask questions about whether or not these differences uh, are, are kind of different for different senior administration, administrators. Okay. So I, apparently there, there are other folks who are having connection issues, um, but I will, I guess, will hope that that's not a big issue. Uh, okay, uh, let me quickly summarize what we found, and then I'm going to dive really into the details of the study. Uh, the first is we found that personality tra traits do indeed predict attendance in a way that's kind of very, you know, the magnitudes being very, very substantial. Uh, the second question, uh, the traits also very strongly predict who it is that responds to the introduction of the intervention and not. So again, the intervention, uh, you know, the governance innovation was to ask the, the inspectors to carry smartphones uh, and, you know, for some people this didn't introduce much of a change in behavior at all. For other people it introduced a very substantial change in behavior. Uh, and so this is, you know, this is going to be, I think, a pretty stark finding, uh, which I'll describe in detail shortly. Uh, in in response, you know, the results that we get on the third research question that I described is similarly, uh, which senior officials are responding to reports of absence in the smartphone is also strongly predicted by, by these personality psychology measures um, of, of, of interpersonal differences. More generally, we're in an environment where we can perform a pretty broad set of tests of whether or not personality is linked to performance and indeed whether or not personalities predict who responds to a change in, in technology. Uh, and the, the results are, in a sense, kind of overwhelming. It's, there's no, no question that this is an accident of statistics. This is, this is certainly something that is real in the data. Uh, so just to quickly provide an outline, uh, I'm going to stop for, for questions at the end of, of describing study one. Uh, next, I'm going to describe the actual program. 
uh, which was at the time was called Monitoring the Monitors. It's now called Health Watch and is being run by the Punjab Information Technology Board. Uh, but I'm just going to describe the essential institutional details that you need to understand the intervention. Uh, then I'm going to turn to talking about how we operationalized the, the introduction of the new technology uh, in, in the context of a research design that allowed us to learn a lot both about these organizations and about such interventions. Uh, and then I'll describe in detail the results I alluded to before. Uh, I'll stop at that point uh, and then ask for questions. And then time allowing, I'll describe a, a subsequent experiment around a new innovation in, in Afghanistan. Okay. Okay, so in this picture is just a, a basic health facility. It's a rural clinic in Punjab, Pakistan. And this is really going to be the object of interest for us in this study. This is going to be where we are collecting our own independent data on whether or not doctors are available to provide services. Uh, and these are the facilities that are supposed to be visited regularly by inspectors. These facilities are responsible for really frontline provision of services, so vaccinations, prenatal visits, uh, and basic outpatient services, and are sort of the first stop for, for someone in Pakistan seeking, seeking health care uh, from the state. On the next slide, what I have here is a kind of dramatically simplified uh, organization chart of the Department of Health, but it, it's important for me to show this for you to understand exactly how this innovation is going to work. Uh, so there's a health secretary who is responsible for this for the province. Uh, subordinate to him are 36 different district level officials. These are senior officials called executive district officers or EDOs, which you can see on the slide there. Uh, and there's one per district, and they have pretty substantial, substantial degree of leverage over the, the and, and oversight over the administration of, of health service delivery uh, in the districts in Punjab. Uh, subordinate to the executive district officer are, are health inspectors, uh, and they're going to have five or six reporting to them, and there's about 180 of them across Punjab. Uh, and their job principally and almost exclusively is to be performing inspections. Uh, so they're supposed to go to each facility in their jurisdiction once a month uh, and keep a, keep a paper form indicating uh, whether or not doctors are available, whether or not medicines are available, and kind of the general shape of the facilities. And then subordinate to the inspector, posted in each facility is a doctor, uh, which is also called a medical officer or an MO. Now, in, in the status quo system, so before the introduction of monitoring the monitors, the, the kind of the way information traveled through this hierarchy was for health inspectors uh, to go to the facilities with a paper form on a clipboard, uh, write down information, uh, and then take those forms, aggregate them, and then present them to, to senior health officials. Uh, and when that was kind of what was providing the executive district officers, the senior officials information on the status of facilities. Uh, again, I will, I'll happily answer a, a set of questions at the end. Uh, and so essentially what we're doing is we're taking the pre-existing system, which is a paper-based system uh, for recording doctor attendance, where the inspectors record attendance, uh, and replacing it on a new smartphone-based interface. So this is using Open Data Kit, which is you know, a, a system that kind of is easily programmed on Android uh, for performing surveys. And essentially what we did was we took all of the fields that existed uh, you know, in collaboration with the Department of Health and, and others, uh, take all of the fields that existed on the paper form and create a smartphone interface such that they could be recorded on the smartphone uh, and transmitted up to more senior officials, the executive district officers. Uh, and so if we take, so here's an example of, of us using this in the facilities. These are actual inspectors using the phone uh, in the context of a pilot. And now, once the information from the reports has been sent, what I'm showing you here is a, screen, a screenshot of the actual dashboard uh, visible to the executive district officer. So if you kind of move along the x-axis, what you see are a bunch of different districts within Punjab, so all of the districts in Punjab. Uh, and the y-axis is the share of inspections that were supposed to be performed in the month that have been performed as of when, when the person logs into the dashboard. Uh, and so what this is meant to provide is, you know, either for the secretary or for the EDOs is, is kind of at a glance, a, a, you know, a, a sense of how many of the inspections that are supposed to have been done have been done. 
Uh, and you can see indeed moving across districts uh, that, there, that there is a lot of heterogeneity in terms of the number of inspections. Now, because this is a dashboard, it's going to provide a number of different views. So if the user were to drill down a little bit, they would find themselves at this page. Um, and this is a screenshot of the web page where each row in this spreadsheet represents a different instance of an inspection coming from the smartphone. Uh, and this provides just kind of a brief overview of a few basic, uh, basic bit of, of information. Uh, and the information uh, in each row, you know, is going to provide kind of whether or not the MO is absent or present, and you can see that there in the fifth column. Uh, and then in the sixth column are also the list of other people that are absent as well. Um, and now the question we wanted to ask ourselves is, well, if all this information starts coming in, are the, you know, are these senior officials going to use it? Are they going to kind of actually take this information and, and use it as, as a basis uh, as a basis for making some changes in, in service delivery. And so to test that, what we did was we introduced an arbitrary threshold at which we would make some of these, some of these rows appear in red. And so there are supposed to be seven staff posted and present in these facilities. Uh, and if three or more of the staff were absent when the inspector went there, uh, we decided that we'd use that as a basis uh, to flag it in red. Uh, and I'll describe on a subsequent slide how that allows us to test the effect of, of, the, of providing the information itself. Uh, briefly, there was a question about the name of the software. Uh, the software is Open Data Kit. Uh, now, additionally, on the interface, uh, we're going to have an opportunity uh, to see it using kind of a georeference view. And you know, you can imagine that this introduces a change in the incentive for inspectors because now their inspections are going to be geostamped and they're going to be time stamped and they're going to be appearing on the dashboard in real time. Uh, so hopefully if the inspectors are cognizant of the fact that their inspections are happening and also observable uh, to their senior officer uh, that this has created a change for them in terms of the incentive to actually perform the inspection. Uh, and indeed we found, you know, collecting based on independent data uh, that, that it more than doubled the rate of inspections. Uh, and then a final layer that we introduce uh, is we ask that the inspector take a picture of themselves with everybody that they're recording as present in, in the smartphone entry. Uh, and so in this case, this is a picture that we actually pulled directly off the dashboard. There you know, are, are many thousands of these pictures, uh, but this just provides a means of, of auditing whether or not the information uh, that's coming in through the smartphone report uh, is indeed, is indeed uh, truthful. Um, so we're collecting a lot of questions, which I'll, I'll happily answer uh, once I've concluded. Uh, now let me turn to describing how we operationalize this, 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 the introduction of this innovation in a research design to start to ask questions about whether it works and whether it works differentially depending upon the personality traits of the people that it's affecting. So what we did was we ran this as a randomized control trial working in collaboration with the Department of Health uh, with the Punjab Health Sector Reform, Reform Program, uh, Lahore University of Management Sciences and others. Uh, and we did this in two stages. So in the first stage in, in Hanawal district, uh, we ran a very basic pilot with just kind of the essential goal of determining whether or not the smartphone application worked. Uh, and once we got it, got it working there, ironed out the bugs, uh, we removed Hanawal from our experimental sample uh, and then randomized the introduction uh, of the program in half of the districts in Punjab. Uh, and you know, this allows us to make a, a basic basic comparison, just like we would in a medical trial, uh, between treatment districts and control districts, uh, and we can say something about the impact of the program. Um, now, subsequently, this has been been scaled to, to cover the entire province because it was found to be highly cost effective. Uh, but for a year, uh, in order to assess the impact, we ran it as a randomized control trial, and beyond assessing the impact, it allowed us to answer some kind of very basic questions of design. Uh, and so is a, you know, sort of an opportunity for us to kind of get the program right uh, before we think about operating at a scale. Um, so there are some really great questions, which I'll be very happy to answer subsequently. Uh, okay, uh, now in the next slide, what you see here, each of these red dots reflects a different facility that we independently sampled. So independent of the smartphone measurements, 
we sent teams of surveyors out to the facilities uh, at random times to perform inspections. And for us, this was just to provide a, a basis uh, of data so that we could understand whether or not the program was having any impact on doctor attendance and whether or not the program was having any impact on, on the rate of inspections. Uh, the way that we're going to measure inspections is that at each of the facilities they keep a register. Uh, when our interviewers go there, they can see from the register whether or not an inspector has been there. They can also confirm this uh, based on interviews of, with staff who are present at the facilities, uh, it, providing us what we think is pretty high resolution data, uh, independent data on whether or not doctors are available and whether or not an inspection has taken, taken place. Uh, and the final piece, as I mentioned, uh, is we're going to want to get measures of the personality profiles of each of the actors involved in the experiment. So this is going to be an experiment that affects doctors, that affects inspectors, uh, and that affects senior officials, the executive district officers. Uh, and we're going to use this big five personality, uh, personality battery, which is sort of the standard in personality psychology, and, and there's some, some consensus that, that this measures kind of five of the most relevant dimensions of differences between people. Um, and so, so here I provide you know, some example statements, but essentially what this is, is this is kind of a self-response questionnaire uh, that we asked everybody to fill out and, and we're pretty successful at getting a high response rate uh, where people kind of rate themselves according to some questions which can then be aggregated in order to build a personality profile. Uh, we're going to also collect a set of questions related to the degree of public service motivation. So this is also something that's been used by personality psychologists uh, to measure a kind of attractive attraction uh, uh, to service in the public sector. Now, turning to the actual results themselves, uh, uh, just to kind of briefly briefly summarize, we're going to find that personality traits really are strongly linked uh, to whether or not a doctor is there, even before the introduction of the program, or even in the districts where we introduce the program. Uh, and so, the way to think of this is if we kind of, you know, move, I guess, move some distance uh, away from kind of an average on one of these measures, and, and we call it kind of normatively in the positive direction. So if we look at someone who's more conscientious than others, it turns out that indeed they're at, they are at work more often, uh, and we sort of verify the, the relevance of this trait using independent data on whether or not they're available. Now, the second set of questions are all related to, to the technology. So did the technology work? The technology indeed worked quite well. Uh, so four or five months after the introduction in our own independent data collection effort, we found that it more than doubled the rate of inspections from a baseline of about 25% of inspections that should have been taking place, moved that up to about 52% of inspections actually taking place. So, so quite dramatic, dramatic effects uh, in terms of whether or not the program worked. Uh, and then we also find very, very stark differences in terms of who responded. Uh, so the inspectors, uh, we can kind of find, you know, the, these personality traits allow us to really clearly identify who it is that responded to the, to the introduction of the program uh, and the differences there in terms of the degree of the response uh, is, is quite substantial. Uh, and then related to the final question, um, did this predict kind of which of the senior officials re react to this report? So again, these reports are streaming into them on a dashboard and we've introduced this manipulation such that some of the reports appear in red uh, and the others appear just kind of in the normal color. Uh, and we find that appearing in red has a very substantial impact on subsequent absence. So it's much less likely that a doctor is absent in a facility once it's shown up on a dashboard as being in red. Now we don't understand the mechanism. I don't know how it is that the senior officials manage to compel better attendance, but we do find quite starkly uh, that introducing, you know, kind of just having a facility show up as red in a report actually did something in terms of subsequent doctor attendance. And now an additional layer to that, and so related to the research question, uh, we also find that these traits predict kind of who it is that's responding. So if I look at kind of reports coming in from clinics uh, in a district with somebody who scores very highly on these traits, uh, they're going to actually be much more likely to respond to a report of absence and the way that I measure a response is whether or not the doctor starts showing up subsequently to the, to the report. Um, uh, and then again, you know, this, this is kind of seems to be fairly ubiquitous throughout, throughout all of the statistical tests that we've performed that both the traits matter uh, and the program indeed had, had profound impacts. 
Now, and what I'm providing here, uh, rather than get into the kind of gory details of the statistics that we're using to make these tests, uh, is just an overview of all of the tests that we could perform and which of those wind up as showing you know, a statistically significant impact. So something that we can say isn't just a result of, of fluctuation in the data, uh, is actually reflecting a real change in the world or you know, is very, very likely to be reflecting a real change in the world. Um, each column in this table is reflecting a different performance. Uh, each, each column in this table is reflecting a different performance measure. Uh, and each of the row is, is reflecting a different trait. Uh, and you can see kind of which of the different actors in the system the performance measure is tied to. Uh, and so, you know, we've, we found, I think it's 23 of 78 potential tests that we could perform. Uh, there is a meaningful correlation between these traits. And so this winds up being important for policy potentially because it's saying that differences between people are very important both in terms of how they perform um, and also kind of who it is that reacts to the technology and who it is that didn't react to the technology. Uh, and, you know, the, I guess the consistency with which these results appear uh, really makes us think that there's no way that this is a, an artifact of, of the data or bad data, that this is indeed uh, really reflecting that, that this is kind of an important, important way to understand differences in performance uh, in the public sector and differences in performance uh, in delivering essential services. Okay. Uh, so let me pause here uh, and I'd be very happy to collect questions at this point. I don't know if I should just go through and do them or if the moderators would like to, uh, but then I'll answer those questions and then time allowing I'll, I'll describe a, a newer experiment that we've just completed in Afghanistan. Great. Uh, so I'm happy to go through the questions that have appeared in the chat window. Uh, okay, so there's a question, is this uh, part of a performance review and linked to performance pay? Uh, so at this stage, we did not explicitly link this to, to any type of performance pay. Uh, in a subsequent experiment working with polio vaccinators who are supposed to travel door to door once a month deliver, delivering polio vaccination, uh, we introduced an element of performance pay. Uh, we asked that they meet a certain target in terms of the number of vaccinations that they perform uh, and awarded them a lump sum for meeting the target. And of course, we could validate whether or not they'd met that target because, you know, we, we could observe perfectly whether or not they'd done it. In this particular experiment that I just finished describing, there was no element of performance pay and there was no kind of additional or new element of performance review. It was really just the status quo performance review uh, where the executive district officer did care whether or not people were doing infections, uh, but there was no explicit change to incentives beyond just introducing the smartphone. Okay. Uh, so let me see what other questions do we have. Uh, again, the name of the software that we used was Open Data Kit. This is kind of freely available. It was developed at the University of Washington. Uh, it's open source. Uh, and there are plenty of developers who can develop applications like this on using Open Data Kit. Uh, now, there's a question about uh, whether or not the smartphone would kind of whether there would be limitations because of you know whether or not there was connectivity in certain regions. Absolutely, this is also an issue that affects us uh, in a number of different applications where we've used similar technologies. So, for election monitoring, which we've used in Afghanistan and Uganda, uh, where again we had a smartphone that we used to monitor these elections. Uh, and also in the project where we're working with polio vaccinators. And, and there are technological solutions to this. Um, so one is to, you know, just have the report be filed locally on the phone, uh, and the phone will then upload it as soon as, as, soon as connectivity is reachieved. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that's something that, that's not been too challenging to develop and, and works. You know, it's not as, as great as if it were kind of in real time. Uh, but we do eventually find out that we get kind of all of this information successfully transmitted once the phones come back into service. Uh, and we've actually done an exercise where we validated that by looking at that kind of where we independently download all the reports off the phone, compare it with the reports that are streaming uh, over the over the over kind of over wireless, uh, and we find that that the performance is pretty good. Um, okay. Uh, did we find, and so, okay, was there any instance of the inspector taking a bribe in return for entering positive data? So here's what we can do on this. Uh, and it's only a proxy measure. 
Um, but what we can do is we can look at a doctor and we're going to visit these facilities. So 850 facilities across Punjab, we visit them at three points over the course of one year. Uh, and if we find in three separate inspections uh, that the doctor was never present, not once at any of the three independent inspections that we're conducting uh, using our teams, uh, and they're always reported as being positive, uh, in the in the administrative record, so the smartphones are always reporting them positive. Uh, we kind of call that a proxy measure of potential collusion. Uh, now, I think that that's actually is getting at something that that is meaningful. I think that there are instances of of people undermining the system uh, because actually because personalities predict that measure pretty strongly. So different people tend to have, kind of have more or less of these kind of proxy instances. Of, of collusion. And, you know, I think sensibly the way that this may be working uh, is it may be just that they call in advance and say, please show up for the picture. Um, so, so I, you know, we can't claim to have, to have completely eliminated all the problems, but the kind of the basic problem of getting an inspector there in the first place uh, seems to have been substantially improved uh, by this program. Uh, how practical is it to take pictures and sending it to, to a central database? Uh, and is there any kind of independent auditing effort? So our team did not explicitly independently audit these things, though it would certainly be, be fairly easy to do with one or two staff. Um, it really wouldn't be that hard. And there's also potentially face recognition technological solutions that would make this, make this easier as well, which I know they've been exploring, exploring in Punjab. Um, so, so it is auditable. Once you have all this information, it's really not that hard. It's very cheap to collect it all. Um, but yes, there is a layer of additional auditing that's going to be required where the, the reports are going to have to be compared either using technology or using a human in the loop uh, with, the, with the smartphone report. So that was a, a great question. Um, it, so, okay, again on incentives, uh, the incentives are just the incentives that they already have. So uh, they report to an executive district officer. The executive district officer we find actually is using the information from these inspections uh, because we know this because, because it results in subsequent changes in doctor attendance. Uh, and so he has some leverage over his deputy district officers. We didn't introduce any new leverage or, or any change to incentives, uh, but we definitely dramatically increased the visibility of whether or not the, the inspections were taking place. Okay, and then I, th okay, so Simon asked, did the positive reaction to treatment inspections drop off over time? This is a great question, and you, you've anticipated this correctly, it did. Uh, so the first measurement we took was about four or five months after the introduction of the program. It more than doubled inspections from a baseline of about 25% up to about 52%. And now when I say percent, I mean percent of facilities that should be inspected in a month that were inspected in a month. Uh, it did attenuate, so one year out in the program, uh, the, the kind of the, so if we say that it you know increased by roughly 27 percentage points uh, at the end of a year it was an increase of about 14 or 15 percentage points so still kind of substantial relative to the very low baseline of, of 25 percent of inspections that should take place actually taking place uh, but there's evidence that it attenuated one year out um, and then we we didn't we didn't follow it beyond that now, you know, just anecdotally, not based on any data, I think the source of the attenuation eventually was that, you know, not clear what the sanction for me is going to be. And so, so, you know, I think this is an example of where operationalizing this in an experiment has provided us an opportunity uh, to start to ask deeper questions about how something like this can be sustained. Also, we're going to find that the effect was sustained differently depending on the personality of the types of the people that are being acted on, and that's because people respond to this change in incentives differently. Um, so we can say something about sustainability based on that as well. Um, and then a, a question on, on sort of cost-benefit analysis. Uh, so, you know, very simple back of the envelope, this, this is just kind of, there's a no-brainer that this winds up being cost-effective. So first, there's a huge cost multiplier relating to the fact that we're using, kind of embedding this technology in the pre-existing inspection system. So in the, in the experiment, we're going to cover half of, the, half of the districts in Punjab. There are 180 inspectors, so roughly 90 of them are going to get phones. Uh, and that's enough for us to get information at least once a month on attendance in all of these facilities. So, so kind of, you know, pretty cheap for 90 smartphones uh, and then the development of a simple backend, a simple open data kit with an open source software 
Uh, and, you know, so I think the cumulative t cost of the program, including the cost of our independent assessments, uh, was something like $90,000. So, so really quite, quite cost effective. And I think this is reflected in the fact uh, that it was subsequently scaled uh, by, by the Punjab Information Technology Board is now a program called Health Watch and, and kind of is the inspection system being used in Punjab, at least to my knowledge. Um, now, yeah, so, so I think it, it winds up being, being kind of, you know, very, very cost effective. Now, the question of did this actually impact kind of health outcomes? Well, one thing that we have is we can take, you know, from demographic and health surveys, which are regularly conducted surveys that collect measures of, of health outcomes, uh, we find that you know living in proximity to a facility, uh, to a basic health unit, one of these rural clinics, is actually is indeed associated with better health outcomes. Uh, so you know there's you know by hopefully by inference it does seem like this is something that is that is creating a return in terms of health services in general, um, and the costs are are kind of wind up being fairly marginal. So so the return on investment is definitely there. Um, Okay, so question, uh, have we thought about collecting more types of information beyond absence status? Uh, the honest answer here is we had a very ambitious ambitious agenda in terms of the sets of information we'd like to collect. We, we'd hope to actually conduct our own kind of sort of demographic and health surveys in the, in the proximity of these facilities uh, to be able to answer questions about changes in health status, uh, but we just didn't have the research funding to do so. Um, so, so really the essential data of interest here uh, is is attendance data, uh, but we have those data, uh, and so I think with that, I've, I've is at least to the uh, to the best of my information, I've answered everyone's question. But if anyone else has any questions, uh, I'd be very happy to answer them, or alternatively, I'd be happy to spend the remainder of the webinar describing a new experiment that I'm excited about in Afghanistan. Okay, um, so I'd be happy to turn to the next experiment. Uh, could the moderators please bring up my slides? Okay, so while the moderators bring up my slides, okay, great, I'm gonna describe this experiment. And so this is an experiment uh, that we've done. This is actually with a private firm in Afghanistan, Roshan Telecommunications, which is their largest cell phone provider, actually the largest taxpayer in the country, and so kind of in, in one sense, the largest company in, in the country. Now, why am I talking about this in a seminar about public sector service delivery? Uh, the reason is because this is something that we're actually going to scale now uh, in the public sector. So starting in February with the transition to Hello, salary Michael, this is using mobile salaries, and it's going to create the opportunity. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we only have financial five more minutes. Like this one. Um, uh, so, if you so just kind of broad background, and kind of motivation for the study. Uh, you know, development economists have, have also have kind of built a consensus around the idea that financial inclusion is very important for the poor. So providing opportunities to save, uh, to access capital, to grow your business, uh, really is an important means of, of facilitating economic development. Uh, and this is something that, you know, at least formal financial products are something that have made very, very limited penetration uh, into developing markets. And, and so, you know, you know, some enthusiasm exists now about the potential for technology to potentially change the state of affairs. Uh, but if you look at the percent of people who use a formal bank account, certainly in Afghanistan, but even more broadly in the developing world, the, the numbers are very low. Uh, and, you know, so, so people have started to ask, well, what, why is that? Is it just a lack of basic brick and mortar facilities to save money? Uh, is it because there are kind of behavioral issues that we all face where we don't save as much money as we'd like uh, and so on? Uh, there's really kind of been a bunch of candidate explanations put out there uh, about why it is that people aren't saving, saving informal products. And so what we kind of asked ourselves was, well, each of those ex explanations, each of the hypotheses that are out there about why people are unable to save, whether it's just travel costs, it's too hard to travel to a bank, uh, or you know, some kind of psychological cost, it's very hard to kind of commit to a pattern of behavior where we save regularly. One commonality of all of these high candidate explanations for why the approach that's worked very successfully in developed countries, which is to just automatically deduct savings from people's payroll. Uh, so their payroll deductions have been kind of one of the great successes for generating savings 
in developed countries. So in the U.S., this would be a 401k retirement savings account where, you know, 5% or 10% of your salary uh, is deposited into an account every month. Uh, and we wanted to ask, can we use mobile phones to do this uh, in Afghanistan? Uh, and so let me describe, describe the study in more detail. But the answer is that, yes, absolutely, we can. Um, and so what we wanted to do is we're going to work with 949 employees of Roshan being paid using mobile salary payments. And so what this means is rather than get a paper paycheck or get money deposited into a bank account using electronic bank transfer, what they would get instead is they would get a mobile money transfer, which is just a text that indicates that your salary has been provided. Uh, they have corresponding e-float in their mobile money wallet, which they can then take to any mobile money agent and exchange that e-float for, for hard cash. So, uh, so anyway, so that's just a different way of, of transmitting someone's salary to them. Do is again run this in the context of an experiment where we're going to have some people who are not automatically enrolled in the program but are free to, to enroll if they like and it's a very simple kind of open enrollment process. Uh, and we're going to have another half of employees who are automatically defaulted in at 5%. Uh, such that 5% of their salary is automatically deducted every month. Uh, and then we're going to randomize them into three different rates of uh, kind of one plan where nothing is matched by the employer, another plan where 25% is matched by the employer, and a final plan where 50% is matched by the employer. So if I put in $1, I get an additional $0.50 cents saved into my account. Um, and now the, the program was very, was really very popular, very, very successful. And so now the, the decision has been made to, to move everybody onto a 50% match uh, and allow them to, to enroll kind of at the level that they choose. Uh, and, you know, we find just like they find very consistently in studies of countries that automatic enrollment really does do a lot to generate new savings. Indeed, the effect of just automatically enrolling somebody rather than asking them to actively enroll themselves uh, is to increase savings by as much as you increase savings introducing a 50% match. Uh, so, so pretty stark, uh, stark increase in, in the Yes, increase. Michael, we need to conclude. Uh, we don't have, we can't extend this. Overview, so we, uh, let me just, uh, kind of a summary if that's okay with you, of, let me just conclude results. right now. And so what we have on the, on the y-axis here is just kind of the percent of people in each of these different groups that are randomized. <laughs> I know it sounds very exciting, uh, but let me let me decisions. conclude. We only have about a minute or two so left. Uh, the lower line, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for uh, uh, like, or uh, uh, for by, participating in this webinar. A very exciting set of questions. Of their, of their I think this was a very interesting um, on the session. Obviously, Michael is one of the best persons on the subject. Right now, in, uh, in, uh, you know, I can probably say, of you know, out of academia, and you can see uh, pretty starkly uh, that just, to, just automatically uh, to carry on the conversation, a effect on, on participation. Uh, you know, you may want to look at the book Lockdown, that indeed Mark Government Solutions from South Asia, Asia so for more examples the and more applications of these, uh, uh, these ideas. It doesn't have the kind of economic rates and economic insights that Michael is presenting, but the very practical oriented, you know, box is this particular idea has been a trailblazer. Uh, thank you, Michael and team. And now it's being scaled up in health uh, and in several other sectors. Uh, and uh, 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 Michael has also done another randomized uh, control trial, which hopefully he'll share some other day on, on you know, incentives of vaccinators. Uh, right now in Punjab, something like 4,000 vaccinators okay. are carrying smartphones and they enter this data a, and that data is being viewed by the chief really, lecturer so and senior managers and, uh, and that is not just about I'll interactive the questions, that's that actually about actual, 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 actual performance. Call. Uh, uh, out so, there in the field, uh, so, so the potential kind of impact of health outcomes is likely to be much higher. So this is just Similarly, the effect on whether or not someone is participating uh, in the program. Smartphones are being I used, and labor, labor department is, is, is using uh, now smartphones for its inspection. Lots and lots of examples, given the simple, useful, obvious technology that it is, it may not solve all of the governance problems, not like the SSP, personality, and many other factors coming. To play, like but will it put your boundaries? This is quite likely. So we'll be, you know, uh, and you would like me to participate in two other webinars that we will have in this series. Uh, please stay tuned. Um, you know, one will talk about really more practical well. applications, the and one which uh, hopefully I present towards the end will summarize all of this and how we can close the feedback loop. Please do give feedback to this session when this concludes. Thank you so much.